biological studies of autism are something that are near and dear to my heart, something that I've done for about 45 years. And um, some people wonder, you know, why do I focus on the biology of autism? Why do I want to know the origins? When does it start? How did it start? How do we know when it starts? What um, will be the outcome for each individual child? How, wh what can biology eventually do to improve outcomes? So I, I care a lot about that. And um, I guess it's going to be a little bit hard for me. Um, I believe in autistic children. I believe in their parents. <clears throat> I believe in neurodiversity. I represent neurodiversity. When I was four years old, I came down with a neurological uh, disorder. It wasn't autism. It was polio. Polio um, kills neurons in your spinal cord, the neurons that go to your muscles. When the neurons that go to your muscles die, your muscles die, you have no muscles, and you're paralyzed. For a year and a half after I got polio, my mother carried me everywhere because I couldn't stand, let alone walk or run. Without support, standing was impossible. And um, when I listened to my aunt, she said, well, poor Eric, <clears throat> he's never going to have a normal life. He'll never get married. He'll never have children. He'll always be in a wheelchair. This is an image of a little boy that looks a little bit like I did at that time, where he had two sets of braces, metal and leather, going up and down each leg and crutches. By the time I was five, this was me. So what happened? Well, by the time I was nine, I started receiving orthopedic surgeries that moved muscle groups that were spared from one location to another. I still have no muscle whatsoever in my lower left leg. I have no calf, zero. I can't point my toes. I can't lift my toes. I can't do anything that you do with your calf. I had no right thigh, no muscle left at all. So what the surgeon did is he took that uh, remaining muscle in my hamstring and wrapped it around the bone so it went over my kneecap so that I now walk with my hamstring as if it was functioning like my thigh. So I had to learn a new method of walking. I'm missing muscles here, here. In my back, I'm missing about almost all of one of the major muscles that comes in and keeps your spine straight and steady. One of those is almost gone. Why is this interesting? So sometimes people have developmental disorders that look impossible to overcome. And like me, they will feel that the rest of their lives. I, it's very hard for me to talk about this because it never goes away. Somehow, with those surgical interventions, which medicine provided, understanding how to return some function to me, it enabled me to start gymnastics when I was 17 years old at UC Berkeley. By the time I was 19, I was on the UC Berkeley gymnastics team. We won NC2A. I was one of nine competitors on our team. Somehow, despite the missing muscles in my back and in my arms and in my triceps in particular, I was able to become a champion gymnast. That's me. So I was, I was nominated as one of the six best gymnasts in the United States in college. 
So I was a runner-up for the Nissen Award, which is the equivalent of the Heisman Trophy in football. Uh, the speaker just before me, Dr. Karen Pierce, is my wife. I did get married, and we do have two kids. And these two kids are really wonderful and beautiful people that enrich my life. I was um, actually relatively moderate to severely affected by polio, yet I was able to do these things. I believe it's really important to do all the do domains of research from those that Dr. Boyd and others have talked about, all the way down to research on the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms in autism. Even those who succeed tremendously in one area of neurodiversity like myself, there remain underlying issues. A neurologist who examined my muscular physiology about four years ago said, you know, there's no muscle in your body that operates normally. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's no muscle that fires and reacts to the neural messages because none of the neural messages going to any of your muscles, even the ones that survived, are normal. I walk down here with a cane because I can no longer walk down steps. Polio has not gone away. It's just gotten worse as I age. Every child can overcome barriers, but only if we help them. Sometimes it looks like they're helping themselves, and certainly I did an awful lot to help myself to be able to get as far as I did. But through parents, through physical therapists, through orthopedic surgeons who transplanted muscles, even the people who made those awful, horrible, wicked metal and leather braces, they helped me. I know what it's like to be made fun of by your peers. <clears throat> I know what it's like to stand in front of a crowd and feel different. And I've more or less devoted my life, almost by accident, when I encountered a person with autism, to autism. At that time, I'm pretty old, right? At that time, nobody know, knew anything about autism. Nobody knew what caused it, what it might be about. Parents were blamed. <clears throat> so I dedicated myself to doing work on autism. Sometimes in my last 10 or 15 years of work, I felt there's been a shift away from really understanding the autistic child in the, in the full way, from molecules and cells and genes, all the way up to who they are when they walk into a grocery store, when they walk into their classroom, when they interact with their peers. I think we need to know every aspect of it. But I felt that there's been a shift. That shift has been away from trying to discover causes. And that's not going to do any child with autism any good, to shift away from being aware and, and, and holding a value for understanding causes and processes. This is a very complicated disorder. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to really have the mindset to share with you the things that we have found. I might share one or two things and then just move on. And I'm not sure if what I said has you know, any impact that's beneficial or not. I didn't actually originally intend to talk about this and then I thought I would, you know, would just give the usual biology talk. <clears throat> actually, um, uh, Karen Pierce gave about half of my talk <laughs> on the fMRI data. So there's not much point in my talking about that. I've been studying the size of the brain in autism because brain growth is important. I've been studying <clears throat> functioning of the brain because we need to know how different brain areas function. I've been studying the genetics and the, uh, of autism in order to better understand how that might be involved in the beginning. I will just sort of quickly summarize a few things, I suppose. Polio is heterogeneous and so is autism. Some people with polio died. Some people with polio ended up in an iron lung for their entire lives. 
Some people with polio ended up in wheelchairs. Some people ended up walking around with huge bra braces and crutches. Some people like me did better, and then others did better still. But it was the same beginning for all of them. It's, it was a, a, a devastating attack on the neurons in the spinal cord. But that diversity is, is there. So I've always cared about that diversity in autism because I believe it's a pathway to understanding how best to help individuals if we know what the basis of the diversity is. But this, I think, is important. I think we've discovered a hotspot for the diversity that leads to autism. This part of the brain is called the temporal cortex. It's shown in multiple colors here. And this is considered to be a core social processing part of the brain, temporal cortex. It's involved in processing language, human voices, faces, biological motion like the children dancing that Karen showed you, and theory of mind, which has often been linked to autism. And Karen showed you this little baby. We record how the baby's brain responds. The stars are out and on the loose. It's time for bed, little cat, little cat. So to snuggle in social tight, affective right, stimuli. Like it's time for bed. When we look cat, at typical cat. individuals, today that made you typical laugh. toddlers who are asleep, it's time for and this bed, is during natural fold, sleep. I'll whisper that same social part of the brain is active, even in a one, two, and three year old typical. It's an automatic response of that part of the brain to respond to social affective stimuli. And Karen also showed you it's this. It's time for bed, little goose, little goose. The star she showed you that in autistic toddlers, there's a tendency there for, to be a, for there to be a reduced response in that temporal cortex region. And what we found and what Karen mentioned to you is that there's a variable amount of response in different autistic individuals. Some have a very weak response and some have a very strong response. So we wanted to know more about the heterogeneity of that. And as Karen said, we used a method called Similarity Network Fusion. It's a precision, me uh, a precision medicine network, a method for bringing together diverse kinds of information, social language scores and brain activity scores in order to identify clusters of patients that have the most similarity to each other in their social and language and in their brain activity. When you do that and you just look at autistic individuals, you find there's three groups of autistic individuals. There are those that have very high ability because they have both high clinical scores and strong brain temporal cortex activation to social stimuli, social speech. Then there's a, another cluster that is probably profound autism as it's been recently described and defined by Kathy Lord and others who have very weak activation in that social temporal region to social stimuli and they have very low um, clinical scores. And this is, shown, this is shown over here. There's low receptive language. When there's low temporal cortex activation, there's higher when there's stronger activation, and then higher still receptive language when there's much more brain activation. So brain activation seems to be driving the acquisition of social and language abilities. And the subtypes of autism seem to be three, with those who are very high ability and those who are really pretty low ability. And it's not just incidental. These one and two, one, two and three year olds have been tracked by Karen. And what we have found is that the ones who have high ability actually start off with lower language skills, but they're the ones that have a nervous system, a temporal cortex that is active in response to social speech. And across time, they show tremendous improvement, reaching near neurotypical average. And they do that for receptive language, for expressive language, and for overall adaptive behavior. And for those who are more pr profoundly affected, when you look at their first and second age points, you see there's very little change. And in fact, their adaptive behavior goes from somewhat better to worse as time goes on. These are very distinctly different outcomes. 
And we need to understand that not all children will be needing exactly the same supports and help. We think that we can take this research to the point where we can understand prognostics and make uh, predictions early on so we'll, we'll have a better sense of how best to help a child. We can also compare these three categories of those that have high ability at outcome, those that are middle, and those that are low. We can better understand them if we mix them with typicals and developmental delay in looking at how they sort out. About 17% of these high ability ASD subjects end up in the category of average typical individuals, and they are the ones that have the best temporal cortex activity. Those who are more profoundly affected don't really change very much. They remain in this low category. We can also ask, well, what's happening with this part of the brain in terms of growth? And what we've discovered is that this same temporal cortex in autism is abnormally enlarged. It's too large. And it's shown here in red. So this is the same part as this up here. Same part here is this here. And that's true both of the cortical thickness, that is how thick the cortex is, as well as how much of that cortex there is. And when we sort these into patient subtypes, we once again find the same three major ASD subtype. A subtype that's more affected, less affected, and least affected. And that has to do with the degree to which that part of the brain is abnormally overgrown. And I come back to that a little bit later. But so far, we know temporal cortex, the social cortex functions differently. It grows differently. And now I'm going to show you new data <clears throat> from Gandal et al. that looked at the temporal cortex in autism as well as other cortical areas in autism. And what they found surprised, I think, everybody. They were looking for evidence about what part of the brain gene dysregulation is greatest. And what they found is shown in this complex bar graph over here, but I've made it simple for you. All these different regions down here show very few genes that are dysregulated. But this region, which is the temporal cortex, this cortex that shows reduced activity, this cortex that's overgrown, it's this cortex that has 2,733 dysregulated genes. That's, that is like six to 20 times more gene dysregulation in ASD cortex compared to the other regions of ASD cortex. The region that shows the most with 3,264 genes dysregulated is this cortex right here. That's visual cortex. That's the cortex that Karen's, Dr. Pierce's eye tracking is picking up on as well. And you know that her social attention eye tracking paradigms look at the issue of attention. So what cortex shows the next highest amount? This cortex at 1,330 dysregulated genes, 1,330, that's this cortex. That's uh, the dorsal attention cortex. So we have social, visual, and attention cortex. And those are the three cortices that show the most dysregulated genes, N not these other cortices. So the temporal cortex is a hotspot for functional differences, growth differences, and gene dysregulation differences. We think temporal cortex is a key to understanding autism. And I'm briefly going to talk about this, and then I'm going to move on. Autism is highly heritable. We all know that. But there's a number, 80% to 90%. 80 to 90% is the heritability in this disorder. So genes really matter. And it's gene functions, that, uh, the functional attributes of genes that really matter. It's, that, it's those dysregulated genes that really matter. And we should know more about them. So we've been studying them in living autistic individuals, not just those uh, that are postmortem, which is fine. But 
You know, someone has to pass away before their gene dysregulation can be assessed. But it turns out that there's a strong overlap between uh, blood gene dysregulation and brain gene dysregulation because many of the genes that are involved in autism, hundreds and hundreds of them that are involved, are genes that express throughout the body, not just the brain, but the heart, the gut, and blood. Autism is not just a brain disorder. Autism is a whole body medical disorder. One of the early pioneering researchers in this field, Martha Dankla, was um, ended you know, her last many years of, of, uh, of service to better understanding autism and helping autism children by giving lectures to physicians to explain to them that the different medical conditions that autistic children present with are real. They are not just associated. They're not just tangential. They're not, um, they're, they're not unrelated to the disorder. And she was right, because we now know from all the genetic studies of autism, the vast majority of genes that have been identified are regulatory genes that express in multiple organs and tissues. Furthermore, most of those genes express in the first and second trimesters not just in the brain, but throughout the body. The most commonly found uh, gene mutation in autism is CHD8. It's found to be important during embryogenesis and prenatal life in animal model studies that show it expressed in teeth, eyes, lung, heart, gut, as well as brain. That's the most commonly found gene mutation in autism. It's not just a brain disorder. We need to help children with autism in multiple ways, not only with their uh, challenges with uh, social uh, processing and visual processing and attention, but, and, and attention, but also with other medical conditions that they present with that are very real. We found in this study where we looked at the blood gene dysregulation in large samples of autistic people, we once again found four clusters, three of which are largely ASD. Low functioning ASD, probably profound middle ability, and then a scattering of high ability ASD. And what we find when we look at the pathways, and these are just three pathways that are interesting, in those who are most affected, cluster four, they show too much activity in a pathway, a well-known biological pathway that regulates the number of brain cells that are produced. It's overactive, suggesting that maybe the overgrowth of temporal cortex might have something to do with it being driven to be overgrown by this dysregulated bunch of genes that uh, are supposed to manage the number of neurons that are produced. This is also true of another pathway. And then this pathway is a pathway that does the opposite. It kind of dampens down uh, dysregulation. It dampens down producing too many. It dampens down producing new cells that may have spontaneous DNA mutations. And in that more affected group, that group there, group four, it's too, the activity is too low. So the activity that should be there isn't there. So this is just, uh, there's, we've actually found something in the order of about 20 different major biological pathways that are dysregulated in ASD, not just one or two. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we now know from the study I just showed you on temporal cortex, 2,700 genes are dysregulated in that cortex. They affect multiple functions. Among the multiple functions are immune functions inflammatory response, interferon, as well as neural developmental and cell production functions. So it's a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted dysregulation of genes. But what, it also, what this data also shows is that the difference between the individuals who are more affected here and the individuals who are less affected and probably have good outcomes, like I had a, good, a relatively good outcome from polio, the, those individuals are here. They're in this area where many of those pathways are only mildly changed. Kind of like me, you know, I, I didn't end up dying because 
neurons in my spinal cord that innervate muscles to my uh, breathing the, um, did not completely die away, although <clears throat> I was supposedly, according to a doctor, in an iron lung. These individuals in this, er in this fourth category that have the most dysregulated pathways, gene pathways, have the least social attention. They have the most shifting of gaze during looking at social. That is, they're, they keep moving away. And they have the most severe uh, ADOS scores. So how did all this come about? Well, we're not 100% sure, but we found something that startled me. You all know that it's possible to get inducible pluripotent stem cells from all of you. If I draw your blood, I'll be able to get from the blood cells, cells that can be turned into uh, brain cells. And I can study brain cells, and I can study the growth of little model, model mini brains called brain cortical organoids. So from these blood cells, we can um, reprogram them to start turning back into, kind of like turning back the clock into um, neural cells and then into brain cortical organoids. We can measure the size of these brain cortical organoids. Each one of these down here in black is it's a sphere showing a brain cortical organoid. So each subject, we can generate many such to get a better estimate of the size of that subject's brain cortical organoid. We can do that for you. It's been done for me. It's been done for a lot of autistic uh, children in our studies with Allison Motry. What did we find? <clears throat> we found that the average size of, these, of each one of these mini brain cortical organoids is about 371 microns by the first month of, of uh, development. That means we're looking at embryogenesis. It's a very early time point. And in autism, many autistic individuals have very enlarged brain cortical organoids. Remember, we've talked about enlargement of the brain in autism, enlargement of temporal cortex in autism. When did that start? How did that start? How is it that that enlargement is associated with more reduction in social processing information, more growth of that social uh, brain, part of the brain, <clears throat> and more dysregulation in that part of the brain, gene dysregulation. We find then that at one month, ASD has enlargement of brain cortical organoids compared to typicals. And this is shown here. We can see um, the average taking thousands of measures, thousands of times here, measuring thousands of these to get a better estimate, thousands of autism, brain cortical organoids, to get a better estimate. And we, we found, what we find is that the brain cortical organoid size in ASD is substantially bigger than it is in typicals. The most remarkable thing is that <clears throat> when we look at brain cortical organoid size after two months, so this is during embryogenesis period, and we look at it, we look at each individual compared to their autism um, social severity score at about two to three years of age, we find a strong positive correlation. The bigger the brain cortical organoid size at, uh, during this embryonic uh, growth period, the more severe the outcome. So to me, that's kind of startling. It suggests that there's something in the, wet, in the biology that already at that early time point is coding for a long-term later outcome of social severity, worse or better. We repeated this, and we got the same result. We found three individuals who had excessively three autistic individuals. So these are the, we, we took these uh, samples from toddlers, grew them to brain cortical organoids, and now we know that you know, that this, this little toddler, a female, had an especially large brain cortical organoid when we looked, and she had especially severe autism. The same with these two boys with ASD, very large brain cortical organoids, severe autism. These others had somewhat lower brain cortical organoid size and somewhat lower ADOS scores, and this is a neurotypical. So it looks like there's two groups of 
autistic individuals. Those who have very severely enlarged brain cortical organoids, those who have mildly enlarged brain cortical organoids, the ones that are more severe have lower IQs in the 50 range. Those that have less enlarged are neuro neurotypical in their IQs. Their eye tracking is pretty good. It's very near uh, normal. Those uh, with severe, they have very poor attention to social in eye tracking tests. Those that have the most severe overgrowth of their cortical organoids, they have the most overgrowth of these, part, these different parts of temporal cortex. So greater severity of brain cortical growth during embryogenesis predicts low IQ, low social attention, and overgrowth of the social brain. And those that have milder enlargement have near neurotypical IQ, more normal social attention, and more neurotypical temporal cortex social, uh, the, the social temporal cortex. So there's a conclusion, which is that apparently ASD, social severity and outcome, can be predicted even at early ages. It can be predicted by embryonic uh, age. That's a really early time point. Things get started that soon. That means that we need to rethink how, we're, how we will be approaching the biology of autism in order to do the most good for each child. We're not talking about a disorder that, uh, that onsets late, but something that onsets very early. We know from these series of studies that temporal cortex, which is a core key social processing area in all of us in this room, that that temporal cortex is having some difficulties. Early on, the changes in the size seem to be driving changes in the growth of that temporal cortex, as well as other cortices, but especially that temporal cortex. That cortex overgrowth seems to be derailing the activity, the normal neural function of that cortex. So I think one of the things I really hope is that we really push NIMH to change the way they support autism research. They are not supporting cell and molecular biological research of this sort on idiopath so-called idiopathic autism. They're largely putting their money towards supporting research on the rare mutations, the mutations that occur in one out of 2,000 autistic individuals, which means like one out of 50,000 people. But ASD is a very common disorder. Where is the research that they are supporting on idiopathic autism? Where is the research they should be supporting on its origins, its cellular basis, its molecular basis, and what we can do about it early on? If they take it just one gene at a time, and there are something, people think there could be as many as 200 different genes mutated in autism. We actually have evidence that I'm not going to show you here that shows that many of those genes are probably false positives, genes that have been in the literature that people think are autism genes. We find them in typically developing toddlers who are perfectly fine. We think, I think, that the study of one gene at a time when there's hundreds and each one of those genes does one particular singular thing is not going to get us very far because it's not representative of the vast majority of autistic individuals who need our support, our attention, and research to make lives different for them. So I'll end with that call to um, change the priorities at NIMH. <clears throat> I will be gone and retired by the time NIMH finally decides to do that. But I know that if the right medical interventions are done, that I was able to stand up without braces. I remember the day my dad threw away braces. Now, I can't walk normally, but I could do gymnastics. You know, I could go to college. I could, I could walk 
the streets of 34 different countries of the world. The right medical interventions can make a difference. And we have to start pushing NIH to produce the right medical interventions for autism. These children have a, have a right to be, uh, to be helped and research to be done. Thank you. Dr. Christian, I saw you um, a while back, and so I apologize if it's not correlated, but I was just wondering if it was. Um, when you presented on your MRI research, lo I long ago, it was like at the Wednesday Club, <laughs> that's yeah, how long yeah. ago it was. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, is there, when you did the MRI study, was it bringing forth any of what you have right here? Yes. Like in that study? Yes. So that did that study show, the M what did that study show? Did it show this or a part of this or? Yes, uh, so this evidence, if we go back, so this evidence here, that's an MRI study. And that's the MRI study that potentially um, you or other people's children participated in. And I might say that <clears throat> what's, what's interesting is our early studies of finding overgrowth in, overall in the autistic brain um, have been examined along with about 47 other studies in the literature plus something like 25 head circumference studies of brain size for a total of about 8,000 autistic individuals and found that it's replicated, that overgrowth is a, a fact in ASD. It's more pronounced in those that have a poor social and language outcome than it is in those who have a better outcome. But it is there. And the thing that's especially interesting is this particular part, the temporal cortex, the red part up there, that is the one part of the autistic brain that stands out when you control for all possible variables in a study of two to 64-year-old autistic individuals compared to controls, a sample size of several thousand. It is the single most solid piece of information about autism brain difference that, uh, that currently exists. Another question? Yes. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Denishak. I'm a primary care physician here in San Diego. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, my brain goes to one place when it comes to primary care, and that's preventative medicine. Yeah. And um, you know, early detection, early intervention is everything that Autism Tree stands for. I wonder, is there? Are you suggesting by um, doing blood tests? That to identify these, uh, the volume of these brain organoids. Are we possibly on the cutting edge of a diagnostic, or screening test rather, to identify these kids earlier on in the you know, perinatal first, first month of life so we could do early detection sooner? Is that kind of what, the, is that the research? I know we obviously want to help yeah. with treatment, but is, there, is the identification and sort of uh, screening also kind of on you know, top of mind here? Yeah, it, it actually is. The, um, there are prohibitions uh, that are cost only. Um, it can be done. So currently the costs are several thousand dollars per individual. Uh, the technology is there to do it, but probably not high throughput technology yet. Uh, Allison Motri works on uh, such technology, so do many other laboratories around the world. It will happen. There will come a time when that will become part of a, a screen, and it will not be so expensive. And it would probably be a, a very useful test. If I, if I go forward, I can show you one thing that's really pretty fascinating. See those, those peaks in green right there? So those are typicals. And you can see those typicals have pretty much the same size even when you measure them hundreds of, you make hundreds of different uh, brain cortical organoids per child. So again and again and again and again to get a reliable measure. And it, it shows that you do that across a child, another child, another child, another child, they all line up. Their peaks are very similar. So actually the neurotypical developmental pattern seems to be a program that reliably unfolds at this time. Whereas above, in sort of the pink lavender, what you can see is each individual has a kind of a broad distribution. 
So some of those individuals have a relatively reliable peak, but others have a broad peak, which means that sometimes when you grow it, it's big, sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's really big. But it's not showing reliability in the unfolding program that drives growth during that period of time. So there's something that is creating variability even at the very beginning of this disorder. I, I swear, if we knew the answers to these, we would know how to intervene and treat ASD. And it's not only organoids, as you're asking, and it's a very important question, and I think the answer is yes. Whoops, I went too far, but <clears throat> it is a molecular. Some of these molecular findings may turn into very early tests. We have a diagnosis um, a diagnostic uh, test for ASD based on these molecular signatures, and they, the accuracy ranges from 84% to 92%, the AUC curve. So it's a pretty high um, rate of correct detection of ASD. And um, the other thing to know is that many of these pathways I talked about are pathways that are actually very um, highly correlated with the ADOS score. So we know when some of these pathways are dysregulated, the score will, be, will go up, more dysregulation, more, more, to very severe, very dysregulated, and there will come a time when there will be early identifiers that are molecular predicting longer-term um, severity scores. And, and I suspect that that's gonna happen probably within my lifetime anyway. <laughs>